Hi guys. In this series of videos, we're going to dig into advanced theories of covalent bonding, specifically valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. And I've got to be honest, I've been very reluctant to create this series of videos for a long time because these are very conceptually complicated and very difficult topics that are somewhat difficult to lecture on. It's very difficult to pack all of the important ideas into relatively short periods of time. So what we're going to do here is introduce the foundations in this series of videos and make use of calculations and computational chemistry at the same time. I'm a really big believer that if you want to really get your mind around these advanced covalent bonding theories, you really have to dig in, do some computations, interpret the results of those computations, and really see how, for example, modern quantum chemistry gives rise to molecular orbital theory. And we can do this easily now on a computer using freely available tools. So you can do these kinds of calculations yourself that really help you see the origins of valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory and really peer under the hood of these theories that remain important to this day. So the title of this chapter in the OpenStax text is Advanced Theories of Covalent Bonding. Valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory are going to be our focus in this series of videos. So we're going to begin in section one with a general overview of valence bond theory. And even before we get there, we're going to talk about what a bonding theory is in general and what we're trying to do with bonding theories as a matter of theoretical usefulness. Why are they useful? How do we use them? That sort of thing. Then we'll get into the general principles of valence bond theory. We'll talk about hybrid atomic orbitals, which are sort of the pinnacle, if you will, of valence bond theory, and really the practical side. We're going to be able to use hybridization in a practical sense for its explanatory power on numerous occasions, both in introductory and especially organic chemistry, where hybridization really takes center stage in carbon-containing compounds and compounds containing nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, for example. Then we'll look at multiple bonds and the valence bond theoretical description of those introduce a bit of a wrinkle when multiple bonds come into little structures, which is kind of a nice segue into molecular orbital theory, which is another way of describing bonding in molecules that allows us to account for delocalized electrons. So by the end of this chapter, we're going to have a really detailed and deep picture of what's going on in a covalent bond and hopefully develop some mental images that we'll be able to use over and over again as we think about what a covalent bond looks like. The beauty of these bonding theories is that they give us robust and transferable mental pictures across many different molecules that we might come across in various fields. Before we get into all that though, I wanted to start with a very basic question. What is a bonding theory? What do we mean by a theory of covalent bonding? Well, here's one way to think about it. You could take a molecule to a computer program, to a computational chemistry program with the nuclear positions and the number of electrons in the molecule and tell the program, hey, calculate the electron density for me. And if you do that, you can get a, an electrostatic potential map like you see on this slide in figure one. This is the electron density in the molecule DBQ. So red regions are relatively high electron density, blue regions relatively low electron density, and roughly speaking, these blobs that you see enclose where the electrons are located. Inside the blob is where the vast majority of electron density is located. This picture on its own, devoid of any other information, actually doesn't tell us a lot, right? It, roughly speaking, we can see the bonds as sort of these cylindrically shaped regions where electrons are, are occupying, but it's hard to get any information out of this picture aside from that. We need to know how to look at this picture, how to really carve it up, how to break the electron density up in a useful way. And this is one thing that bonding theory should absolutely do. They should allow us to, as I describe it, carve up the molecular electron density in a useful way. And by useful here, we mean with great explanatory power that allows us to make predictions, make useful observations of the molecule, infer, for example, reactivity. We'll come back to that in a second and various things like this. Related to that, a good bonding theory should provide an explanation for why atoms form bonds. Why are atoms relatively stable in bonds as opposed to by themselves? What is it about covalent bonding that is stabilizing? 
we also need at least a qualitative sense of the relative energies of bonding electrons. There are different types of bonding electrons, and this is one insight that bonding theories will give us, and they have different reactivities, different relative energies, different behaviors, different spatial distributions. A bonding theory should give us a sense of those differences that's really true to reality um, and reflects all as, or as many observations as we can muster. This fourth point might seem a little different from the other three, which are highly general, but really describes modern bonding theories, the, the bonding theories that have really stood the test of time. They relate to this journey that we can imagine an electron going on and, and going from an isolated atom into a molecule, the atom to molecule transition. Any bonding theory these days is going to describe molecular electrons in terms of atomic orbitals, at least in a rough way. And this is conceptually nice. It allows us to use what we already know, for example, about atomic orbitals to gain information about molecular orbitals. And then finally, any good bonding theory through all of these other things should allow us to really bridge a gap from structure to reactivity, allowing us to infer how electrons are going to behave from their nature within the molecule. And we'll be bridging this gap, particularly in organic chemistry courses, when we start making deep predictions of molecular reactivity and bonding theories play into that in a very deep way. So we're going to get, begin with the idea of valence bond theory and the, the concept of valence bond theory, which is one of the first bonding theories that really endures to this day. Now, one thing I haven't said yet that I should really mention now is that neither of these theories that we're going to discuss in this chapter, valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory, neither theory is better than the other. It's not that valence bond theory is better than molecular orbital theory as a rule or vice versa. The, the reverse is often said that molecular orbital theory is quote unquote better than valence bond theory. Simply false. Theoretically, they are equivalent. There is no difference between molecular orbital theory and valence bond theory on theoretical grounds. So it's not like one is wrong and one is right. They're just more useful in some situations than others. For example, when you're dealing with a molecule with only localized electrons, with only lone pairs and single bonds, valence bond theory is perfectly fine. It is a wonderful and simple and elegant description of the molecular electron density. On the other hand, when you're dealing with delocalized electrons, molecular orbital theory is often the better way to go. And so we can use either of these theories in different situations really to suit our needs and rest assured that they're theoretically equivalent at the end of the day.